I want to get started with uh, a couple of questions that we'd like to recognize here today. Um, for the all, it is FFA Day on the Hill, so welcome everybody, welcome to uh, the Agriculture Finance Committee and uh, of CA. Um, it's more nice to be here with the President uh, down in Nebraska, is that right, Mark? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Palmyra High School, Palmyra, Nebraska, all the Mighty Panthers. Mighty Panthers. I was the uh, FFA president there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so if Mark can do it, anybody can do it. All right. So, what well, if you're wonderful? Um, one of our individuals, I have a uh, special guest, uh, multiple special guests, but uh, Representative Wills, uh, you'd like to come forward here and and if we just please state your name for the record and, and uh, recognize our, our special guest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Anna Wills. I'm the state representative in Apple Valley Rural Mountain Folks, and I'm honored to be able to recognize uh, Jim Erdahl today. He lives in Rural Mount, and I have a resolution here I'd like to read. Thank you. House resolution recognizing R. James Burgle on the occasion of his retirement in January 2016. Whereas, Minnesota's Future Farmers of America, FFA, Board of Directors, appointed R. James Burgle as their Executive Secretary in October 1981, and whereas, R. James Burgle served nearly four years in the military and then attended the University of Minnesota Princeton and the University of Wisconsin River Falls and graduated with an agricultural education degree and whereas after graduating he taught in the St. Francis and Cassin Mandeville school districts. As a member of the Laconia FFA chapter, he received his state farmer degree in nineteen sixty seven and has since received honorary state and American degrees and was inducted into the Minnesota FFA Hall of Fame in 2010, and whereas for the last 34 years, Secretary Earl has managed the day-to-day -day operations of the FFA, including leadership conferences, various aspects of the annual state convention, managing the membership of over 10,000 members and 190 FFA chapters, and processing individual and chapter award programs for the many events and activities offered by the FFA. And whereas he works closely with the state FFA advisor, Department of Education, Minnesota FFA Foundation and alumni, and Team Ag Ed to ensure continued opportunities for students interested in careers in agriculture and related industries. And whereas he has also worked with the Minnesota Veterinarians Association, University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine, Minnesota State Fair, and FFA's foundations to establish and maintain CHS Miracle Birth Center's display during the State Fair, and whereas after retirement he plans to do more gardening and traveling with his wife Jane. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration of the House of Representatives of the State of Minnesota that it thanks R. James Grill for his dedicated service and wishes him well in his upcoming retirement. Signed by the Speaker of the House of Doubt and the uh, Chair of Rules, Joyce Kevin, and myself, and the House of
34 years ago was very fast, and it's, uh, it's been a humbling experience to have other FFA members as I have seen them grow and witness them to become leaders in their local communities. And uh, whatever their voice brought, uh, leadership is very important to the FFA. And I hope that you know, by giving them the opportunity to take that and learn and serve uh, their communities in the city of Minnesota. So I want to thank you very much, Chef, for doing this for me. So thank you. So I want to thank you for your leadership, for all that you have done. You brought your fan gloves on us. Great to see you. So thank you so much, Representative Wills. Thank you for uh, sharing this uh, to stay with us as well. So we have uh, another special person to recognize also, um, Representative Cindy. Would you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, I have a House resolution here recognizing the Fisher Bear family for their outstanding work in organic farming uh, on the food farm in Red Shaw, Minnesota. It's been something like this. Uh, uh, Jane and John Fisher Bear started growing organic vegetables in 1973 and became certified organic in 1990 started the first community-supported agricultural operation in the Duluth area in 1994. And whereas the food farm, with 360 acres, certified organic farm, offers summer, winter, preserving poultry egg shares, enabling the CSA members to receive fresh local food most of the year, and weekly summer shares are delivered to 15 locations in Duluth. Well, some of the farmers, uh, uh, some of the farm produce is available at the Whole Foods Co-op at Duluth, and Duluth Bill at Chester Creek Cafe. And whereas John and Jean sold the farm in 2010 to their son, John Key, and his wife, Annie Dugan, who hosts the Free Range Film Festival in their barn each summer. Under their direction, the farm has continued to grow and prosper, 39.7 people. And whereas the Fisher Merits have contributed to the Red Shaw area, becoming a hub for organic farming in northeastern Minnesota by training new farmers and hosting farm tours and other events to educate the public. Now, therefore, and resolved by the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration of the House of Representatives of the State of Minnesota, that it thanks and commends the Fisher Merit family for its remarkable work in leadership in organic farming and extends the best wishes to the entire family for the future. This is a document signed by a good house speaker of Minnesota House of Representatives, Joyce Peppin, Chair of the Rules and Legislative Administration, Mike Sunday, State Representative, and Chair Rod Hamilton, State Representative as well. I'd like to present the Fisherman family with their new addition, Truman. Thank you, Representative Sundin, and we have a future farmer right there, so uh, this is wonderful. Congratulations, congratulations, and thank you for being here. This is, uh, this is exciting. Uh, we like to recognize people uh, who have done special things in agriculture and some of the farmers. We're so happy that you brought your new addition. So welcome to the committee, and you are welcome to come back at any time. So, yeah, congratulations. Uh, we do have a call. Uh, members, uh, let's uh, approve the minutes. Uh, Representative Miller? Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, any discussion, corrections? And now uh, I'll do some favor, say aye. Uh, uh, opposed? Motion fails. Thank you, Representative Miller. Um, on the list, I think we have uh, an overview of the uh, farm business management. As I thought, should we start there? Uh, Mr. Schoenfeld, will you want to give us an overview? Please state your name for the record and begin. Mr. Chairman, I am Jerry Schoenfeld, and it's a little bit more than an overview. There's a bill before you as well, Mr. Chairman, that you represent the field. So maybe she should join me at this point. Um, Vice Chair Kiel is making her way up front. Mr. Chairman, uh, I represent several people in this endeavor today. Uh, in the fact that I work with uh, the Minnesota Association of Ag Educators over the last uh, year, since about 2010, have had the opportunity or the unfortunate opportunity in some ways to 
we've worked on several different task forces trying to deal with the shortfall uh, financially with the Department of Business Management that has, has been, been there for a number of years. Um, at the same time, uh, I bring this to you as part of history. Mr. Chairman, you present your bill for the LSA Policy Committee. I'm not part of your bill. Uh, in, in involve money for education, uh, including farm business management. And one of the uh, things that the Coalition of Farm Minority Groups uh, put us one of their top three priorities was to try to deal with both ag education retention, but also more specifically the farm business management problem. So well, this is not something new, it's something that's been with us for a number of years, and we go on the start out by stating that, but I think we've had three or four different task forces uh, try to deal with this for a number of years. Some have been by the system itself, some have been by the DLC, uh, there have been others that have been inclusive of industry, uh, and so a lot of people have taken a look at this, and I'd like to give you a little bit of review today uh, about this. First of all, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Okay, the farm business management education programs have been filed in order to have education. So since 1953, presently there are approximately uh, somewhere between 22 and 2300 farms in the midst of the technical and community college system that are enrolled in the farm business management program. Our farmers are students in course of study designed to provide management education to farms and areas and developing a better understanding of the financial position of the farm um, business as they strive to meet their personal, family, and business goals. And I think that is one of the things that's kind of unique about this program. This is not a typical academic program in a college system. And that's part of the problem. It's very square big and round hole uh, sometimes. Um, and so it doesn't, there are constraints that are put on uh, the college systems that go contrary sometimes to uh, where I think a lot of people think that the farm business management program should be. And some of those constraints, as an example, is that the college, uh, who I was talking this morning to, uh, to one of the uh, uh, presidents, and he indicated to me that one of the problems they've got is that this is an ongoing program, it's a continuing education program, that can stand for a very long time. And one of the problems that they face as well is that they have the, uh, the uh, Office of Higher Learning, I think it's called, that also takes a look at their programs and they, they uh, determine as to whether they fit into the kind of the college structure as such. And this is a program that has some difficulty in doing so because of the longevity of the public and the fact that there isn't a specific graduation time for people in this program. Um, each of 40, 46 academic instructors, and I'll point out this is that there is uh, roughly 46 or 47 full time instructors that are still. In this program, and then there's an additional uh, number of instructors that are adjunct or they're, they're part time, uh, and in some cases, people that are hired on just a few months basis to work in the database. So there's a total of people in the 46 that are in the program, basically, we've got 46 or 47 uh, instructors today on the account of the program. We have a number of about 40 to 45 farmers each. In addition, farmers are expected to be able to, through this program, to establish personal family and business goals, compile active farm records, analyze and interpret records, and demonstrate the function of management, understand the short and long term effects of management decisions, apply economic principles, use data to optimize the organization and efficiencies of the business, and to understand the foundations of human resource management. Uh, it's done primarily through a one on one delivery system which provides that the, the instructors actually go out and visit the farms and, and integrate not only the, uh, their education that they, they uh, try to impart to the students, but they do it on an individual family basis. And they take a look at um, not only the, um, the financial uh, construction of the farm, but they also take a look at the kind of uh, physical aspects, the agronomy, the animal husbandry, things like that. It's, a, it's an integrated uh, situation in that on a one-on-one -on -one delivery system. And that's why it doesn't necessarily always fit with, with the typical classroom situations that you see uh, where you might just teach a specific area of or economics or a specific area of management. Um, along with that, um, they also use a number of other areas, including uh, I would say that farm business management structures probably some of the first to extensively use uh, 
miniaturization and uh, the World Wide Web and that kind of thing to be able to uh, do some of their uh, information gathering and so forth. In terms of particular curriculum, it's fairly wide, so anything that involves record keeping, uh, balance sheets, cash flows, business analysis, marketing, um, estate planning. And, so, and, and uh, as I mentioned, estate planning, for instance, it gets into a lot of very personal family decisions. Yes, we did when we talked about the research of the website, Bobby's example, talked about the importance, uh, or I think it was when we talked about the uh, mental health. And, and, and uh, this is unique in the sense that there is a personal family component to this that goes beyond what you typically find in instruction in the fact that um, the, the, they will face financial decisions that affect family, uh, personal decisions, things like divorce, things like escape planning, death of a family member and others. And so this is all part of it, and along with that, we do have a support mechanism, uh, even though mental health component goes along with that. Um, if you look at the student distribution, it's quite wide, statewide. Um, it is, you can see that it, with the exception of maybe Northeastern Minnesota and the metropolitan area, uh, that it is pretty inclusive, even though there are some organic farms, I think, that are around the metropolitan area that are also included in this. The Department of Agriculture is working with organic farming to uh, uh, be part of this program. And uh, as you take a look, uh, we'll look at the database later, you'll see that there are actually specific areas for organic farms as well. Um, what's the trend line? And this is probably the most important, in my opinion, as to looking at this program, program from a legislative standpoint. One of the things that uh, has happened over the years is that uh, this mass-use system, and I'd like to back up just a moment and point out that when farm business management started in the 1950s, it was not by the mass use system because the mass use system did not exist. Um, the uh, original area was it was part of the ABTI system. And the ATBI, ATBIs were across Minnesota. And the farm business management structures in large part were actually housed in local school districts. So that oftentimes you would have a high school ag teacher as such, and you would also have an adult farm business management instructor within the school districts. When Minnesota was formed, all of those things came together under the ABTI system to become a component of Minnesota, and it became part of a much bigger system. And so I, I, I point that out because I think at that point there was some kind of disconnect a little bit along the way in terms of uh, what the program was all about. Um, if you take a look at the trend lines that you see, you see a couple of things. The Minnesota legislature has participated in support of this program uh, in a more specific way than it has many other programs uh, within the system. And there's a couple of reasons for that that we're going to get into. One is the fact that for many, many years, uh, the legislature provided some additional subsidies to the, uh, to the students. Now, there technically some of these students could qualify for uh, financial aid, but it's pretty limited uh, under the conditions of, of farmers, uh, most do not. And so there is a little financial aid that comes in, but it's not very large. Um, but there was a specific subsidy that was actually uh, done through two different legislative initiatives uh, that provided a tuition subsidy. You see it listed there through the years. And in 2012, uh, because of the unified budget system that, that uh, the community works under, they basically eliminated that subsidy uh, that had been there in the base budget for many, many years. Uh, in addition to that, the uh, NAP and the NAP and student credit, you'll see that in a period of about 14 years, it's gone from about $56 per credit, and each one takes 10 credits, so you can multiply it by 10, about $560 in terms of an annual cost, and what the day is over $1,700 in an annual cost. The faculty headcount has diminished significantly over the years. Um, Going way back to the 2000, we had 105 faculty. Today we're down to about 46 or 47 at the time. And the student head, head count, however, has maintained somewhat similar numbers over the years. And what that meant is that instructors have added more and more students to their individual uh, programs. And then you can take a look at the amount of state analysis that are submitted. And in some cases, you might find two people involved in a farm business management program, and only one analysis is needed for the uh, program. 
Next thing I'd like to find out is the uh, state database and the significance of that. Uh, the database is recognized nationally, and I would ask you to look up the world that copies of the um, of the Farm Business Management book in this section. And you'll see that this one comes from southern Minnesota primarily, and uh, it involves uh, South Central and River Land and, and, uh, and the different colleges down there where this put together. And what it, uh, what it does is it compiles all of the financial data from all the farms in the world. So the significance of that is, is, is far more than what people oftentimes recognize. And this is one of the points that I'd like to point out that doesn't necessarily always sync with regard to the system and its new system. And the fact that this data is public data that is used by many, many people uh, that goes far beyond a typical academic uh, area. Um, the return on investment partners in this group alone, and this is two year old information, so I will tell you that because of the increased prices, that number probably is closer to $2 billion. But two year old information that we had collected uh, showed that it was $1.4 billion annually in terms of the sales of the people involved in, in the uh, program, and that they have huge economic impact and return on investment to the state, which is part of my argument as to why we should provide additional funds for this program. The other thing about it is, unlike a lot of education where a person gets a four year degree, as an example, and then hopes that they can use it somewhere down the road. And as most of you know, uh, many times they do change uh, areas. They have degrees in certain areas, but they move on to different areas. In this particular case, it's a matter where the education is immediately taken back to the farm family and to the farm itself, so it's an immediate return. There's a point I think we start talking about the bill itself. Now, I want this to be understood. Farm business management has never, never been a profit center for a college, ever. It has always had a shortfall. And this legislation has recognized that for a very long period of time. In 1986, you see up there in terms of previous legislation, I took this right off of session law, and uh, it, was, it was put forth. In 1986, they were still the ABTIs, and there was one, the legislature funded $1.375 million to the ABTI system to be part of the base for uh, this program. Uh, secondly, you'll see that in 1999, if you look down towards the bottom, uh, you'll see that there's a uh, provision in there that says that part of this, these funds go for farm business management. So that provided approximately an additional million dollars to the system for this. Again, initially it was part of the base. And then thirdly, in 2005, there was another million dollars that was put into the system. And what this did is backfill some of the shortfalls that took place in the system. But in 2012, as you saw by the trend lines that we looked at earlier, um, the municipal system being short on funds from quite frankly the legislature not to get these in funds as rapidly later in those years as they had in the past. Um, made decisions and they made priorities. And they made two decisions that really affected the FPM program. The first was to decentralize the program. Initially, uh, and for, for all the years that it was there until just the last couple of years, our business management was a statewide program. It had a statewide director, it had it with six regional deans uh, that worked with the individual instructors around the state. And it was a centralized program. But the decision was made uh, on the institute to decentralize it. And so the debate are eight individual colleges that have FDM programs in them. But instead of having a statewide director as kind of being the, and the chancellor as being the uh, kind of top on down administration of this program, it now has a situation where each individual college president the eight college, colleges uh, make decisions on this program. And one of the things that that is, uh, that is heard is, quite frankly, there have been many meetings together with different college presidents, and they don't always agree. They have different priorities within their individual colleges. They have different priorities in terms of 
of how they see the program and its value and so forth. And that has caused some, uh, some, some of the difficulty that we have. And uh, that at least is what is my opinion. Uh, secondly, um, the other part is that as the funds were kind of absorbed into the system that initially had been there in the, uh, in the base for FBM specific, um, then it was not a key surprise that the individual colleges dealing with financial programs would find it more difficult because the back bill wasn't there from the legislative funds. So that's part of what would happen over the years. Um, that's not to say that there couldn't be changes made to accommodate this. But I can tell you that when you look at the projected shortfall, I'm showing you numbers by the individual colleges that is actually two years old. Uh, I've talked recently to Ms. Du, uh, folks, and I think in the last couple of weeks they updated these numbers. And it's not quite as bad as it was. Uh, it's dropping about 3.5 million to about 2.7 million as the shortfall. This is not, I believe, to include uh, uh, all of the indirect costs of the 2.7 million. Uh, if you look at the numbers I've got, it's, uh, here it's about 2 million difference because it doesn't include direct costs, indirect costs. There are indirect costs that are charged by the system in each college to pay for administration. And those indirect costs are not in these numbers here. But basically what we're talking is about a $2.7 million shortfall. Uh, the bill uh, provides for $2.4 million a year under Representative Hill's bill, uh, and that provides for this uh, and also for some mentoring programs to support the project. But um, it doesn't take care of the whole issue but I think it goes a long way towards it. And I think what it does do is allow that working with some flexibility that perhaps there are still some areas within the individual colleges that they can take the that just a little further. Although I can tell you that I'm not, I'm not going to use his name, but I'm going to quote how uh, one of the people I talked to yesterday said that we've got a shot of money we can in terms of the administration side of things. Um, there is no longer a state director and there is no longer regional agency. So those people are part of the reason that the amount of money that is required uh, has been uh, come down. Um, just some of the populations served will there be any traditional production farms. Um, the reason in particular to point out that organic farmers are involved as well is because the Minnesota Department of Agriculture has also provided some funding uh, on the side for some of these programs. And if you look at the chart, you see there's some other involved in that is for some scholarships that come through there. Um, and then there's some potential solutions. And I can tell you that I have served on a couple of them, and that many people have put a lot of hours and a lot of time into looking at potential solutions. But in the end, there hasn't been a PC on a potential solution to this problem. And, um, and so we, I'll at least share with you some of the ideas that came out of different task forces that looked at this, including the presidents of individual colleges. Uh, first of all, one potential solution is to leave the delivery system it is when increase what is charged. In other words, this model would require a higher tuition rate for each credit of instruction for which students register. Projected cost per credit approximately $300 has been uh, put out in the past. Uh, if the short was, the shortfall was spread over 70 or 25,000 credits. Now, there is a, a one that you'll be looking at here in a second that's been was proposed at least by Northern College, I believe, in terms of looking at moving to a customized training mode. And I can show you that in a second. The second is to leave the delivery system as it is, will offer a basic level of credits at the current tuition rate and offer more enhanced instruction for a fee for service for customized training mode. For instance, some studies have done previously at the a significant number of farmers don't see a reason to move the program for credit and would be fine with an uncredited program. Based on 50% of students being gained at $1,700 a year for six years, plus those greater than six years would have to increase to $4,000 to make up the differences in that kind of scheme. Then one of the solutions that was proposed was to change the delivery system to make the program affordable with the current tuition rates and faculty workloads. In order to do that, to serve more students, either through more regular on-campus classes or through an online or hybrid delivery of some of the course content. There was a study done about people that participated in this program and farmers that were participating in this program. And according to a June 2012 Institute study, online learning 
was one of the proposals that was put out there to either put online and change it to the finished one-on-one -on -one delivery system. But the online learning was the least preferences, the least preference of the students that had it on a scale of one to seven, one not preferred to seven, had it preferred. Uh, there was a 3.5 for online and a 5.8 for individualized instruction. And there are other kinds of models that could come forth. And I've taken this directly from some of the conditions you have proposed. I'll show you the next budget. It's the first college that has actually made a change and shift other than laying off uh, people in the system. Uh, and that is more important to take a look at uh, what we take here in terms of trying to meet some of their shortfall. And I don't know that this means all of it. I think there is somebody here from Northern who might be able to uh, talk about that more if you want it. But uh, the base tuition presently is around $165 or for times 10 credits, so about $1,650 per uh, year. Uh, the proposal, I believe, under their customized training program, would take that to about $2,225 a year. And the point of this is that over the years, that the legislature had oftentimes taken a look at this and, and uh, wanted to make sure that this maintained availability and cost-wise was available for, uh, for farmers of all levels, entry level, people that didn't have a lot of money and so forth. And so that's some of the proposed things that you've seen out of the Eastern College. Other considerations? Any questions at this point that anybody can have? I'm um, not sure if you can just uh, get through your presentation. That's all. Uh, all right. Okay. But the other considerations are this, are you to consider? Balanced staff being cost per raise in tuition only. There's about 45 students per class at $2,250 of growth. In, in terms of the customer training proposal, uh, would provide about $101,000. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I'm not really happy about. Okay? But it's a fact in, in the way this situation is. The average age of instructors in this program is probably at about 56 years age, similar to what our farm, uh, farmers are. And one of the problems you've got here is that under the Minsky system, and when I talk about the Minsky system, I'm not criticizing them. Okay? I think they have a problem with trying to make this in balance. But, but what I'm saying is that in some cases, and I talk to Representative Peel and her son, I believe, uh, did this. In some cases, when instructors have been laid off to try and conserve money, uh, and it's kind of cheap and very engaging, aren't you? Um, but some of the instructors retire. And when they retire, they open the shop for privatization of the system. And so that in her case of her son is an example, she went her brother, I'm sorry. When one of the people retired, uh, they left the system. Uh, the the, the uh, position was, as I understand it, not built. And privately, the former instructor took on the same farmers that he had been working with for a number of years and privatized it. And because they don't have the overhead, because they don't have the administrative costs and a lot of other things, they can do it at a cheaper cost. And so in some cases, that, and, and that works fine for a few years. It works fine for those farmers that move on with the same structure they had in the system to a private system. The problem with it is in another five years when that instructor retires, there's no way going to be coming in to replace them. So if you move it out of the system or moves out of the system, uh, there's not an instructor there uh, five years from now to replace that and provide the service. The second is balancing up the cost by raising student loans. So, there's a couple of problems with this one is that most instructors currently operate well over the minimum 346 credits necessary for what's considered the base load in their contract. And to be blunt about it, there's difficulties in changing the contract. They've tried for years to gain it. Third, charging for the database. One of the well, some components that charge for the database. The database is queried by thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars, thirty to thirty-five thousand reports annually. And what I mean by this is this database is online. Everybody from bankers to Congress to the state legislature uses this database. They use it for the information as to what's happening in farming in Minnesota uh, and across the nation. When I talked to Colin Peterson, who was at Peterson, and he said that when they wrote the phone farm bill, they used the database in order to use the number one, figure out what to do about it. 
the database is considered a perfect code built with public data and public support, so charging is prohibited. In addition to that, uh, privacy issues, you can imagine what farmers would say if their data is being used in a for sale sort of way. Um, changing the delivery model, there's been discussions about changing it to an online delivery system, there's been discussions about having it at 60 credits so that people would have to move on after six years and so forth. But I would argue this, that we have doctors, we have attorneys, we have CPAs, we have teachers that all have continuing educational requirements. And in farming, it's no different. Farming changes every five years dramatically. And that's why they need to get this program on a longer term basis. And one size doesn't fit all for every college. Each college has a different idea of what they want to do. Each president, each college, and faculty, and they have different ideas as to how to solve their own problems. One of the things in the Represent Peel's bill is to provide more funds to the MC so that they can be individualized for challenge grants or individual colleges. And last, the farm business made of management and FBM databases is an investment in the state, and that's why I would argue that you should be putting investment from this legislation into that investment in this program. It provides, it, it can also acts as the legislature's budget for data. I will go back and show you at least 12 different times that this legislature has mandated to the FBM program to do certain things, to participate in the dairy diagnostic program, to provide, you get a real finance authority loan through uh, our Department of Agriculture, they are required to be part of this FBM program. It's in the in the legislature, the intent originally was to make sure that there was a good management of the funds that the state provided to the individual farmers through the program. Secondly, financial ownership, seven times when you had uh, disaster bills, you provided that financial ownership, uh, people that are in financial ownership have to be mentored by the FBM instructors. It was involved in the mediation program and still is in financial accountability through the world's largest production ag database by the Farm Service Agency, Federal Government Agency, and the Farm Credit Services Congress, the Legislature, and Department of Agriculture. And the last thing that I'm going to bring up here today is one other problem that I think could be fixed, but it's a difficult problem for the system to fix, and it's a difficult problem politically for you to fix. Many years ago, there was a, uh, a, a, a policy established by this legislature that said that senior citizens, those over 65 years old, on an open space availability situation for ministry programs, would be able to take classes for, uh, I'm not sure the percentage, but I think it's about 20% of what the regular tuition cost is. I know that FBM, for a typical person, pays $1,700 for this particular open space uh, situation, it be three hundred dollars, and we do have farmers that are over sixty-five years of age that are taking advantage of that. And uh, I don't think that's consistent with paying for this program, quite frankly. So, Mr. Chairman, that's what I have to do. I'm there, and I'm open for any questions for you. Uh, I just, I guess, I don't want to pay all that is key: accountability, flexibility, investment, retention of this. All right. Thank you, Mr. Schoenfeld. Any questions for the testifier? Any questions for the testifier? All right. Thank you, Mr. Schoenfeld. Uh, Representative Peel, uh, do you have others who would like to testify on the bill? You want to move the bill first? I uh, move the bill, if that's all right, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, and I have a point of interest to that bill. All right. So, Representative Peel uh, moves the bill to 888. All right. We have a bill for us to amend it. Representative Peel will move the A1 amendment, correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. All right. To your amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, on uh, page one, line 11, um, as Mr. Schoenfeld pointed out, we want to delete the farmer out of that um, because part of those the challenge grants are for mentoring programs. We don't need the farmer uh, listed there. So, that would be your question. Is Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative um, Keel, on this like, partial meeting, farmer again, but you talk about mentoring programs, mentoring for whom? Vice Chair Keeler, Mr. Schoenfeld, Mr. Chairman, this is a fairly small part of this, but one of the problems is to maintain instructors. And so there are mentoring programs for the instructors to help maintain the instructors and provide them. Okay. Uh, any other questions to the amendment? 
Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. To so the bill as amended. Um, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as uh, Mr. Schoenfeld so pointed out, um, the need for uh, sustaining this program, and uh, as he pointed out, my brother actually uh, had built a relationship with his, so he uh, moved on, and, and uh, I find it interesting. My nephews are not going to figure out what they're going to do next. But um, uh, I also have, my farm has also benefited from this program. My son came back to farm with us and uh, uh, participated or is pers participating now in uh, Northland Community College's uh, program. But I've also had benefit because um, they provide not only individual training, but also um, uh, the marketing aspect where they put uh, a group of farms together and work on a on a basis of collaborating with each other, uh, having conversations about where we think marketing is going, what's happening in the world um, market, and um, I spent quite a bit of time doing that before I became a legislator. So I handed that off to my son, and just by way of note, he was really enjoying the uh, lucrative part of farming, and then now that it's gone down, he asked me if I'd take it over again, and I told him, uh-uh, you got the good parts, you have the bad parts. So, <laughs> It's not fun selling me when it's two dollars and, and uh, it costs you quite a bit more to, to uh, uh, produce. So, but with that, I also asked um, uh, Mr. Castle, uh, Gary Castle, to uh, come and talk about uh, uh, Northland College, in particular that is up in my district, um, to the, what they are doing and uh, the choices they've made with this. Um, Thank you, uh, Representative Keel. Please uh, testify or state your name for the record again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Kerry Gaskell, Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs at Northern Community and Technical College. Oh. And uh, this morning, I would uh, just like to briefly um, follow up on Mr. Schoenfeld's uh, discussion and tell you what Northland's doing. Um, First of all, I want to make it very clear to anybody that has this in Northland that has no intention of ever closing the FBM program. It's a valuable program. It provides a very, very needed um, education and training service for the farmers in our area, and we are fully supportive of moving forward with this. We just have to figure out a way to make it um, work financially. And so, uh, as Mr. Schoenfeld mentioned earlier, you've got the history of, of uh, costs to the college and, and how that's kind of flowed over the past several years. I want to pick up more briefly with um, exactly what we're looking at doing in terms of a, uh, a budget projection and an opportunity for us to use a continuing education type style, a customized training style. Uh, process. Both the slides that Mr. Schoenfeld had there uh, showed Northland's uh, budget projections for FY16 and 17 based on our current uh, information. Please keep in mind that the, the assumptions for this uh, projection included things like our uh, cost increases and included things like uh, our base tuition uh, not changing and included things like having six unlimited full-time faculty members available for us to uh, utilize in that program. We currently charge $165 a uh, credit hour for tuition. Uh, we also have an analysis surcharge for $2.30 and a fee of $9.31 for technology, which is what the farm pays per credit hour for an FBM program at this time. Uh, based on the FY full year equivalent credits that we will get, or what we estimate we will get for this year, that will come out to about um, 105.3 FYE um, per student and uh, roughly a revenue of $557,910. Uh, expenses are around seven hundred eighty. The costs are, are just as Mr. Schoenfeld explained earlier. Uh, we've got various estimates, but they go anywhere from 1.3 to 1.5 cost of providing the program. So we always operate in the deficit. We believe that um, for fiscal year 16, that will put us about $225,000 uh, in the red, and for fiscal year 17, about $252,000. Now, if we go with our proposal, for customized training, we'll be actually converting uh, our instructors to a customized training process, which means that 
they will go back into our chain. Uh, but if you go and see under Article 11 of their contract, it doesn't change their seniority, it doesn't change their uh, benefits, it doesn't change any of the things that uh, go along with being a uh, stronger in the municipal system. What it does do is allow us to adjust the cost of the program. And so for us, um, we initially are proposing about a $225 base tuition cost without an analysis surcharge or a technology fee, which will still leave us in the hole for fiscal year 16. Uh, and all things being the same, which we honestly don't think will be exactly the same, but to compare apples to apples, it'll uh, give us about an $8,000 um, uh, profit, actually, in the fiscal year 17. We would adjust those costs based on needs for the program versus a fixed cost that we have no control of. Uh, the idea being that we'll be able to at least um, put as close to breaking even as possible. We're not in it for a profit. You, I'm sure you are um, well aware of that. Our, our interest is to make sure that our, our customers are served and that the impact on college um, by each program is, is uh, taken into account. And right now, FPM is, as Mr. Shook mentioned, combined with all the other programs at the college will start talking about funding. And so it, it does have an impact on the rest of the programs. Thank you, Mr. Council. We have a question from Sam Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Keeler, uh, Mr. Castle, you can answer this. In this. I have two quick questions. One may this may not be the right committee, but I um, noticed that the bill is added to the base. What is the what is the current base right now? We'd like to take that uh Rosa Keel, Mr. Schoenfeld. See him come to the podium. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Miller, it's added to the MLC base. The purpose of adding it to the base is to say this is continuing money. Sure. Uh, uh, and and the dollar present is about a million dollars. Okay. So, one more question, Mr. Chair. Um, again, this may be the wrong committee, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Why is this funding not appropriated in the higher education for med school? Why is it coming to the department? Why is it coming to our community? Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Schultz, uh, Representative Miller, as you looked, as I went through the um, situation here, you'll see that three times in the past, this legislation did, legislature did exactly that appropriate funds for this program, specifically to Minsky. As I pointed out before, one of the problems is that as they change their priorities and as they uh, have to screw down their financial situation uh, when there's shortages and so forth, um, their priorities are somewhat different. And as I pointed out, uh, we put about the legislation did on three occasions put in four three four three million dollars into the base that um, was used for this and specified through the higher ed, uh, but it, for one reason or another, kind of went away. And so what we're attempting to do here is take a little bit of the burden off of their back and provide through meal C. It's a much smaller unit that they can deal with by a long process and to fix flexibility and customize it for the individual colleges. That's one of the other changes that's taking place. I, in the audience, uh, there are other people from, from the growth instructors and also people from the uh, administrative level of MINSCU. And in our private discussions, they are supportive of this method. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Schoenfeld, and believe me, I want to see this money go to these programs. It's just, I, I guess it's disappointing to me that the far majority of our MINSCU schools are in agricultural areas. And for them to think that this is not a priority is just disappointing. But again, perhaps on committee, I may have to go over back to that committee sometime in the near future. So thanks for explaining that. Mr. Chair, I don't want you to show them that this is, is not a priority of MINS2. It's a competing priority amongst many other priorities. And I think what the reason the bill is ahead of this committee is to say that um, it's a priority of legislature to the extent that it has been sometimes in the past to be certain that this happens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. President Castle, I don't want to get into the weeds too far on, on teacher contracts and things like that, but 
Is there a limit as to the number of credits an instructor can, can have or the number of students they can, they can work with? Yes. In the uh, answer, there is a, it is a little bit both ways. When we, when we're talking about two distinctly different particles in the, in the contract. Article 11 covers all of the instructors outside of FBM. FBM uh, instructors are uh, work on a credit per credit basis. And we do a look back at the returns in August. Uh, we do a look back in January, February, and then again in April, and then add all the credits that are collected during the spring. Because there's some individuals, and talk with each farm individually and sell the credits individually, then it becomes more of a process for them to get all those put together into one place. But um, that's exactly how they're paid. So there's a there's a minimum requirement that they have, that they're expected to have at the end of the year, and then they can go anywhere up to 1.4 of that. And that's uh, essentially what our numbers reflect. There's a 1.4 for all of us. Vice Chair Kim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to point out we do have an instructor in the audience, so maybe we would like to hear from her a little bit. And I realize we have uh, Mr. Chair, some other bills, so we need to move on. But uh, would that be all right if we ask her to come? Uh, we will, let's, uh, yes, it will be. I want to hear from uh, BK testimony. We'll move around this up um, by the bottom of the hour, no latest, because uh, we do have uh, two bills, and I think we're going to need about 15 minutes for each one of those. So. I feel like you're going to just fire it down, that'd be fine. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Maybe a quick question uh, before the testifier speaks. I've been uh, visiting with uh, some students at the private colleges in my area, and they're, it, it, this kind of surprises me that they're at a very uh, prominent liberal arts private college, but they, they have a lot of interest in agriculture. And the one of them was talking about trying to set up some kind of program where they would uh, learn some of this kind of information or do some mentoring or whatever. And I'm just wondering, uh, and I'm not sure exactly how this would work, but perhaps uh, Mr. Schoenfeld, you'd be willing to talk with me sometime about how to make such a program accessible to students who are not necessarily in an ag track, but have interest in farming and could benefit from this kind of program. I'm not sure exactly how to work that out, but if you could talk to me sometime. So, there's a body is shaking his head, yes. So, all right, very well. well um, can you testify on your station name for the record? Can you please? Pam Hillen Camp, Farm Business Management Instructor at South Central College in Mankato. Well, well, test me out. Thank you. Um, I, I was just asked here um, today to testify a little bit more on the mentoring program. I know that was a question. Um, I, as a young instructor, was uh, privileged actually to be part of a mentoring program. We actually have two different tracks. One is our PAP program, our professional experience program, and then also we have a, a mentorship program that we have retiring instructors stay on for a moment of time, usually about six months, six to eight months, um, to help that new instructor build that relationship with those farm families. Um, for those of you who are part of a farm family or came from a farm family, know that farmers, um, uh, our relationship people, and so it is key and vital to keep uh, our young instructors that are coming on board to help build those relationships with our farm families so we have really good student retention. Um, part of our challenge with student retention is um, there is a non-compete clause in our article, and um, it does not defer our retiring instructors to take those students privately. And what ends up happening is that it starts to compromise the integrity of our state database. Um, so again, I know Jerry mentioned our state database, and I don't think we can stress how important that database is to Minnesota and also nationally, um, as we, uh, as I learned today that we had a farm bill written based off of that analysis. Uh, farm business management in the state of Minnesota contributes 65% of the farms to that national database. There are 10 other states, including Minnesota, and there are also two other non-farm business management programs that contribute to this national database. And um, you start taking out 65% of that database, and um, it's not worth as much as what you think. Thank you. So, first of all, to testify, can you please spell your last name for the record here? 
Yes, that's Human Camp. U H L E N K A M P. Alright, thank you, Mr. Human Camp. And you answered all my questions. So, thank you. I'm looking at uh, Mr. Sean Bell and I'm just smiling. So, no, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome back. My last name is Human Camp. I've only been in fourth grade before I could just spell it wrong. Um, I, I just do have a couple of other points that I'd like to make with regards to the program in general. It's very important, uh, you know, uh, since the legislature session started, uh, the things that have been impacted by this and outside of probably the federal judges were in the Timberwolves. This is probably the second most common uh, theme that I've received from my constituents about how valuable the program is. And I did want to point out, uh, and this year we can't do that just now, too. You know, there's, there's a lot more of this program than just um, having young farmers and more advanced farmers. It's all the data and stuff that's uh, down there. I, I do have one other question, though, and that is this. I know you talked a little bit about Section 11 and so forth and so on. Somebody could, if they, you know, and maybe you, the bill as it's written, the changes that are being proposed and so forth, do you feel like uh, that, that you're very supportive of some of the changes that, that may be a place in, uh, throughout in your contract and so forth. Is that really understand what kind of thing after? Yes, you would get. Um, yes, currently, right now, I, I, we have not heard of anything in place. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we have another instructor in the room, but currently, we have not heard of any changes that have come forth for Article 12 in our unit contract. Uh, Mr. Schoenfeld, uh, Mr. Chair, will just add that bit there. there. This is a little bit out of our ballpark because it is union contractual negotiations that do affect this, but it's not controlled by any of us. Um, but um, the, the uh, Article 12 is, is basically a long time to set up to uh, kind of incentivize more, uh, more credits coming into an individual structure, structure instructor, but over time it's changed in such a way that it's, it's, the system thinks it's costly. Um, and so that has been on the, it is on the negotiating block. And I think, I don't mean to call you Joe, but uh, I think he can shake his hand. Yes, that that's at least being discussed by the, by the union contract. It has little to do with this bill. Thank you, Representative Fabian. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have 17 minutes, or we'll be coming back this evening. Uh, who's next? Uh, Representative Pop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shane, I have a question for you. Um, the Vice President Castle. Uh, Vice President Castle, if you could please uh, come back up here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony. I, I had a question about the senior citizen rate. I wanted to know if Northland, um, right now, how you are um, handling that. If, uh, I know there are some different colleges doing it differently, and I just was curious about Northland. Um, sure, I don't think that uh, I don't think that comes up as a question for us. I haven't heard it as an issue at all. I honestly don't know that uh, we're being impacted by that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, uh, so, do you have any students that are over 65, and are they being charged the lower rate, or are they paying the full price? Mr. Cassidy, fair question. I can't answer that one either without going back and checking, but I'm happy to tell you. Thank you. And I have just one other question, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I just wanted to know if Northland has laid off um, any farm business management instructors in the last five years. Mr. Cassidy? Yes. We have um, this year because of the requirements notify two unlimited full-time instructors and two um, full-time probationary instructors. Now, we'll have to do that by November 1st. We haven't um, been able to receive it. Mr. Chair, just to follow up, are you intending to be able to call them back, or is that uh, maybe this is inappropriate to be asking you at this point because you're having to um, do some of that negotiation and whatever, but I'm just, if you're able to answer, are you, um, if you would. Mr. Yes. Well, we would very much like to. Um, it's going to be very dependent on 
I'm awesome and how we can how we can make it happen. Representative Poppy. Thank you, uh, Representative Lloyd. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just like to make a brief comment. Uh, uh, our uh, uh, farm, uh, farm management program comes from Central Lake College in, in Rainer. Uh, I had the pleasure as uh, uh, served as the president of our local Eaton County Farm Bureau chapter for a number of years. One of the things we did with our uh, we've got a scholarship program there that we try to aid the young folks uh, involved in agriculture at the college level is we specifically adjusted our program so that we could award a scholarship to our young farmers that were, were certainly involved in this program. Uh, and uh, it is a huge importance to those young farm families. Uh, if they don't have a uncle or a dad, they can sit down and and do the numbers with, and that's just one example of that kind of thing. That brings uh, from a mentoring standpoint. So, uh, th this program has uh, a lot more support in a lot of area areas you may not realize. Uh, it's a huge deal for uh, our local farm bureau to make sure that uh, we do those scholarships uh, for those folks that we're able to do two a year here sometimes. So, but again, this is hugely important uh, uh, in our area there and uh, North Central Minnesota. Thank you, Representative Lloyd. Uh, is there anybody else that would like to testify for or against this bill? Who come down now? Okay, who it is? And we have about uh, 14 minutes. Please state your name for the record. Who you represent? <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, my name is Tom Peterson. I represent the Minnesota Farmers Union and support for uh, farm business management programs. One of our top priorities this year. As uh, and appreciate Representative Hale uh, doing this bill. Definitely in, in the northwestern part of the state. Uh, we just got a call from a farmer from Convict yesterday. I don't know whose district that's in, but very similar, uh, you know, talking about just concern about the program and, you know, that if they're losing too many instructors, that more than the instructor they go to has too many students, they're not able to do this in person uh, visits that the farmers really benefit from. And so, Really appreciate your consideration for this. A couple other points that I wanted to make that haven't necessarily been made enough is we always are looking for how do we help our beginning farmers in the state, right? We're always saying how do we help our beginning farmers, but we have great programs at this Department of Agriculture, and good for all of you to know, especially some of the newer members. We have the Rural Finance Authority at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and as I understand, the farmers told me the Rural Finance Authority several of their loans, including the beginning farmer loan, the AE bond loans. They require you to consult with a farm business management instructor. And so that's how a lot of our newer members, uh, newer farmers, come to farm business management as well and do then learn the value and see the value in it. So when we're thinking too about helping new and beginning farmers, this legislation is very important for them. Also, um, Mr. Schoenfeld mentioned the organic program. That was something I worked on uh, several years ago with that Senator Dill. And we were always talking about. You know, is organic farming good or bad or, you know, uh, but the interesting thing is we never had the numbers, right, to back it up. And so one of the things we went to look in was uh, creating a separate, you know, or, or uh, uh, organic farm business management program. And this week we had the uh, top organic advisor to the uh, U.S. Secretary Will said, was here, Betsy Rockwell was here at the USA, we had a meeting with all the organic people. It was interesting that they were all saying, you know, all the people who saw how great this program is and how proud she is to see Minnesota doing that. But at the same time, I couldn't have to sit back and say, hey, we've lost 50% of our instructors in the last five years, and we're very concerned about this. And, and we love the program, but we got to add what we for it. we got to turn it around. And so we're seeing some of those numbers in the important part of that database. So I appreciate your consideration for this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Any questions? Testifier, seeing none. Now we do have another testifier. Please state your name for the record. Who you represent? Me, Mr. Chairman. I'm just pleased for the record. I'm by someone that was most of the year old. We also have this as a very high priority in our uh, uh, supporting this program in our agenda for this year. And we hope that you would uh, move forward with Mel and, and consider it favorably. Right, thank you. Any questions for the testifier? No, I'm seeing none. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Anderson, did you have a question? Yeah, just a good question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We were talking about the 
uh, some instructors being let go, things like that. And, and, and we all I think, realize the, the very value of this program, especially to the younger farmers. So what happens when instructors are let go? Is there a penalty given to the younger farmers that may be working with that instructor so they move on to a, a different one? Or are all of the, the farmers which those instructors just uh, just not want? I don't know if you would like to add another Mr. Schoenfeld. Well, I would make the comment that I believe, and maybe, maybe somebody else wants to comment, but I believe that the uh, existing instructors uh, absorb those farms. And so it's making it a little bit harder and harder for them to be able to uh, handle. Like, I, and I know I have that statistic, and I can't remember. Mr. Schoenfeld, you must have it. The instructor for um, farmers. In terms of individual farmers, it's typically about 45 farmers per instructor. That's true in, in some cases in the past that others have absorbed it, in some cases in the past that simply lost out. And again, recognize that each of these dodges now is individual, not the statewide system we once had. And then as individuals, for instance, in Alexandria, there's only one instructor. Now, they chose to keep this as a priority for them as one instructor. They, they, they do operate a loss, but it's not a large loss because it's only one instructor. But that instructor would go in that particular college. There'd be no replacement there unless someplace else could bring it together. Now, there has been a move by the Institute to create two uh, agricultural areas of excellence, which uh, one is, is in northern Minnesota and one is southern Minnesota, and there's discussions about whether they can take on additional people. If, if, if that occurred. One of the other problems here, just real quick, is, is that, that, you know, Francis and Northland, they had six instructors. They also had, in the past number of years, I'm not sure if it's Northland, but at least one of the colleges that have served Northland had a uh, regional dean, basically, that also was let go, that helped kind of keep the glue together in this thing. Um, and when the four instructors were given pink slips, I guess is the easiest way I'd say, uh, this last fall, Part of the problem there is that many of them are out looking for other jobs. They lose them, they lose them. Because they don't know if they're coming back for sure or not. Now, they may very well, and they're trying to ignore them to make this thing work so they can, and that's part of this goal, is to help them, you know, and hopefully uh, help them along. And we're so interested, I think we may have somebody that uh, moved forward that would like to answer the question. Potentially. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, for the uh, My name is Zach Mata. Um, I'm Wilbur, work with Ridgewater College. Oh, I'm Mrs. Yes. And to answer the question, on uh, uh, Edgewater, I mean, when we started, there was 13 of us, and now we're down to eight. And and all of us have absorbed those farms, or they, in most cases, when they retired and the instructors found that the position wouldn't be refilled, they started a private business just to keep it going, hoping maybe someday that you can come back. Yeah. And so some of those farms are receiving education, some are not. And I maybe mean, more than anything to answer that question, if you notice from Mr. Schoenfeld's uh, presentation, we've lost the number of instructors have gone down, but the number of farms in the database really hasn't. So some of those, you know, the existing instructors have absorbed that, but we're getting to a critical mass. I did something I never thought I knew for the first time to turn a farm away. I simply, I, I'm working with too many people, I just can't, can't work with anymore. Some matters. Well, thanks again, Mr. Chair, and thanks for that testimony. It just, just shows us uh, that uh, we need to infuse additional funding to get more instructors out there with the farms because there's a limit to how much you can do, how many farms you can work with, and uh, we, need to, we need to keep this going. And if I can add that, two more layoffs and uh, two other instructors that were laid off at South, South Central College as well. So there was a total of six that were issued. Thank you. Uh, we have Representative Pompey, Representative Fabian, and then we're moving to Representative Keel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I just have a question about uh, mechanics of this. Um, I've had the great honor to serve on the ESC board for the last two years and will continue to do so. I appreciate that opportunity. I'm just, um, because this is quite a bit of money um, going to the ESC board, and I know that we currently uh, give out grants and do different things, but I'm just wondering a little bit about the, um, um, the process going forward if uh, this were to be funded with regards to 
any further criteria um, for it. it. It seems like, I mean, obviously, there's a need to fund uh, fund business management throughout the state. I don't d dispute that at all. Just trying to figure out if this um, is the, the best solution or part of the solution or whatever. But um, how this, how you foresee criteria and the process moving forward? Um, Representative Peel, or I think I'll have Mr. Schoenfeld. All right, Mr. Schoenfeld, we have about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Chair Representative Bob, Bobby. Um, as, as, as he's pointed out, and again, I've talked to the Minsky people about this as well, and they like this idea. Uh, the concept is that money flows from the Department of Ag, like we do in many cases, and MLC. Uh, MLC, I take a look at the statutory references of MLC, it has all the power to do this. Uh, it does have the power to ban programs to fund school secondary uh, educational solutions. It's in the statute. Um, and so, so many people leave here to be serving on MLC along with other, I know there are a couple of other legislators and other people, and there's a representative from Minsk on there. Uh, that hopefully, that you would be a part of the solution in terms of what the challenge against would actually require. Now, there's another bill that's been introduced and, uh, by Representative Mark Burke that provides direct funding to Minsk. And part of those requirements in that bill are that the, that the uh, institution would have to maintain the number of uh, students and the number of Instructors that presently exist based on the existing database. And I think that that's something that could be incorporated into the challenge grant. I'm not saying it would have to be. In other cases, there may be situations where people might want to expand an online system, a particular college, and maybe it would provide the flexibility that they could do that. But I really think uh, your participation along with the other legislators around that board, along with the institute and the university of Minnesota, because we sometimes forget them. They are also part of the system because they they maintain the database at the University of Minnesota as part of the uh, Farm Financial Center that's at the university. So I think that flexibility is there, and I guess uh, you know I don't think I can sit here and tell you exactly what the requirements of those challenge plans would be, but I think that there's enough knowledge there in a small enough group of people that they can put that together in a very effective way. Thank you, Mr. Schoenfeld. Anything else? Um, there's some Fabian, you have a good question. Just very quick, Mr. Chairman, I want to comment. Um, with regards to some of the uh, incidents in the mirror, I, I know personally and spending time at Northland with uh, both instructors and talking to farmers and having conversations with uh, Mr. Castle and President Nick, you had very, very difficult decisions. This is not something that anyone is making lightly. And um, I appreciate the hard work and the thought that's going into this from all sides. And, uh, I uh, support finding a, a resolution to this very, very badly program. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Last word. To you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, would, I would urge you all to uh, support this bill. Um, it, it is an issue that, as Representative Fabian has talked about, that we really struggle with um, just how to um, uh, protect this program, uh, keep it running. Uh, and, and sustainable because it, it has had some real rocky, as you see, some ups and downs. But very important to um, our base in agriculture. And um, as someone pointed out here, it not only is helpful for uh, uh, generational succession in agriculture, but also uh, we talk often about trying to get young farmers started and they don't necessarily have a connection with the farm. Um, this is another opportunity for them to be able to connect with maybe a farmer who's retiring, doesn't have um, anyone succeeding them, and um, they will be able to work and help the, um, a student, a young farmer, be able to be successful in uh, agriculture. And, and that's, you know, uh, one thing I want to remember is this is a program it is solely dedicated to making sure that not only Minnesotans, but the world are fed. And and they are charged with a very high responsibility. So with that, I would ask that we uh, pass uh, House File 888. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Gail. And the, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to hold House File 888 as amended. We laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus and agricultural finance bill. So, thank you, Vice Chair Keel. Thank you for all the testifiers. Uh, that was the motion. It is uh, laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we
do have uh, uh, Florida Bills, um, Representative uh, Purcell, and also we have uh, Representative Figgy. Uh, so, to our colleagues, if you have uh, uh, testifiers, um, I would like to uh, proceed. Uh, Representative Purcell, would you like to? Uh, um, would you like to bring in your testimony from the testifiers first? Uh, you're our guest in this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee members, uh, I, uh, um, I'm fine in having a discussion here, and I, uh, I'm i not aware that these are testifiers for your full representation. Mr. Chair, we do have, uh, gentlemen, we do have uh, two testifiers uh, for this. So, I mean, uh, it's okay that we have got your testimony uh, on this topic quick, and then we'll uh, come back to the bills if that's okay with you, Terry. But, all right, thank you, Representative. So, uh, the first individual looks like uh, Mr. Peterson uh, with uh, Farms Union. Uh, once again, if you can please just state your name and, uh, and again, please, Mr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, Tom Peterson of the Minnesota Farmers Union, and again, this is one of our other top priorities, and I think this committee has, has heard enough about wolves, and I am, you know, visited with most of you that how important this is, and, and because of the court decision, um, also I think we are going to see significant losses this year, just on, based on what we've been talking about. We had a meeting. Uh, Last week, in representative of some Eads district, as well as the Pacific district, it was well attended by our producers, and I was shocked at how many, and we asked them to raise their hands, uh, and had a loss, and then how many had filed a claim, and how many were waiting for a claim, and as you know, the, the fund is out of uh, money currently, and our farmers do uh, prefer this program to the new federal program that was in the Farm Bill. I've been uh, working on the federal program some because for farmers, not sure what the legislature is going to do. That could be an option for them, but it pays a lot less. And it's, a, it's a lot less of a, uh, uh, of a dollar amount. The other problem is, I, again, I was in the office on Monday and I talked to the state director. Um, it's, you know, it says you have to go into the office. So talking to our farmers, they have to go in, they have to file a complaint at the local FSA office. Again, just one of the basic parts of that. If you're in where the, where the hot zone is for Wolf Hills, St. Louis, Pine, Carlton, uh, the, the, uh, the guys in Duluth on Wednesday afternoons, and Aiken County, Representative Duluth can tell me I heard he's there on Thursday afternoons. And so it's not like uh, your district, Mr. Chair, where somebody's in the office every day and it's easy to deal with. You also have you know, so a time frame to, uh, to get the claim. I also understand from farmers that uh, they're worried about how long it will take for the reimbursement on that claim. So just a little bit about that, that we, we appreciate and ask for funding for this program. Another thing I've heard as I've been talking about this and visiting with a lot of the farmers at the meeting, uh, Representative Sabine and Representative Brad last week, is a lot of times we think it's just calves, and calves are the easy picking. But I'm surprised at how many, it'd be interesting to look at people lose cows. And when I looked at uh, the guy, and I, I brought him to, I think it was the policy committee, a farmer, and his lot was, he lost seven uh, animals, it was cows, you know. And so you're paying back, you know, the market rate of a, a cow is one thing, but a cow is another thing. Because as it was told to me by farmers, and uh, some of you know, if you're raising a cow, you're raising it to maybe give you six or seven cows. And so we're not paying them for that. We're paying them for the market loss of that cow. So there's a, a thing that I think hasn't been brought up in all the other talk on wolves we've had, and something I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Um, Mr. Peterson, um, I had an interesting conversation yesterday. Uh, an individual came into uh, uh, the office in which I occupy there, and they said, we have an idea. And it was, we'll pay you out uh, for these claims. And they said, what about uh, if there was some, some dollars available to um, invest in, whether it's guard dogs or guard donkeys, um, you know, to prevent this from happening. Uh, your thoughts on that at all? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I, I've talked to groups about that too, and it'd be interesting that the DNR currently does have, you know, some help, as I understand it, for fencing. They actually have a good spot on the website, things to do, and this group, uh, 
had talked with us before and now he's got a kick out of her because they were in a posture donkey, so they called it the donkey posture uh, animal idea. So I'm not sure how that would go. But uh, and just to let you know, a lot of our farmers do take that very seriously. You know, it's not like they're just out there rolling in the pasture. They have great pyrenees, they have llamas, they have donkeys. And they'll tell you, uh, uh, the, uh, the next action you found the county, he told me that, you know, farmer bought a llama to protect his herd. The most killed the llama, and then they came back the next day and killed the, the other llama. And so, farmers do take that. They take fencing precautions. They take a lot of precautions. And so, if there's something you can look at in the DNR budget or <laughs> the other idea was going to be an LCR project uh, on the, uh, the, what I call the donkey cost share idea. So, always open ideas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, what's your opinion? Do you want to comment on it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've talked to some of the producers out in my area of the state that have this concern about that, too. Um, they would rather raise cattle than llamas. And uh, it's just one more thing to take care of, and uh, they understand and appreciate uh, the attempt, and uh, um, there's not a whole lot of support for it in my area. Thank you. Uh, what's that look? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, We've had some experience in our area, in Coming County, with that, uh, and uh, actually had to go in quite some time ago uh, and uh, testify here uh, about making it possible to reimburse those uh, folks that used to have sheep in our area that have long quit because it was too difficult to be reimbursed for the sheep dogs. Because uh, in that case, uh, this is a number of years ago, we were talking $2,500 an animal. And, uh, they worked for a while, but ultimately they killed the sheep dogs. Uh, that, uh, and, and so then you've got a situation where, uh, well, who, who reimburses the farmer for the sheep dog? And you're talking $2,500 a piece for those. Uh, and uh, so there's all kinds of things you do, uh, uh, but none of them are foolproof. And uh, literally every animal that's been put out there to guard uh, uh, livestock, uh, at one time or another, has been uh, killed by wolves. It's simply because it's the size of the pack. Three wolves, no big deal. Eleven wolves, it's over. I don't care. You put an elephant out there, they'll get it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk. I had a recent experience uh, in the nearby district, actually, in Representative Moline's of uh, some wolves that were hit very close to a farm. Fortunately, uh, the farmer didn't sustain any losses, uh, but this is an issue we need to take care of, and I know that that farmer in particular does have a donkey that has kept them away, um, but the wolf that they got, I'll stand up for the cracker, was about this tall. So it was one big SOP, <laughs> and I think it would take out a donkey pretty easily, and, and you know, again, fortunately, it hasn't yet. I think it probably is in relation to pack size, but we want to share that as well as it's understood uh, last week. Well, thank you, and I think SOP, that is the proper terminology for a female dog. If I, I, I believe it is. I believe it is. Thank you, Mr. Sunday. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, it was mentioned the uh, meeting that we had with the farmers up in uh, my district, mostly, actually. Uh, and we heard several reports and lots of uh, anecdotal information about uh, the, uh, the damage that the wolves are doing to the animals um, in a handful of counties up there. It's a very serious situation. We uh, saw many reports and read many reports on that. And, uh, at the end of the meeting, I reminded everybody that those, uh, those wolves can't read those reports. They can't read, but they can't breed, and this situation is only going to get worse unless uh, the population of the uh, the wolf population is uh, under control, and I think the state of Minnesota was on the right track. Unfortunately, the federal uh, government is uh, taking exception to that, and uh, with the court ruling, they now have custodianship over these wolves. And I will vote and support both of these bills that are before us today, but I don't think we, anybody here should. Because if the federal government wants to uh, take custodianship of these animals, they can pay the full freight to farmers. And I'm uh, very disappointed that uh, the federal government will pony up and uh, pay what they readily admit is uh, their responsibility. Uh, Mr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Chair, and on that point, 
Um, we, we continue to lobby our federal government very hard on this issue because it helps us. I mean, I think it's correct. We definitely like heard that from the farmers in our area. I know it's not in your purview, but our other big concern on this that's compounding it is that, you know, the, and maybe you'll put this on the Environment Committee, is the strappers are not funded in Minnesota, that, and that money should come from APHIS and USDA, but it's not. And so we only have one strapper for the whole state right now, and that's going to come home the situation very quick, because it's calving season now. It's starting to begin calving season, so. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Uh, we do have another testify. Once again, state your name, if you will please, and who you represent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the record, Doug Hustleman, Minnesota Farm Bureau. We are also here today to support these two bills. Uh, right now, uh, farmers in Minnesota are left totally unexpired, left totally exposed with no ability to protect their assets and, and their livestock. And so we believe that there has to be efforts on me. We are also back right now in Washington, D.C., working on trying to make some changes uh, at the federal level. But here in Minnesota, we can only do what we can do for Minnesotans. And in our estimation, providing this kind of funding for compensation for our livestock losses is the most that we can do and is something we should do. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, so I will... Uh, uh, representatives, I will move uh, House File 348, the Purcell Bill, uh, to the point before us. Uh, both of these will be held over for possible inclusion. Representative Fabian, if you'd like to move your bill to get it before us. Uh, excuse me, you can't move two bills at the same time. So, we're going to do it. I'm trying to streamline this thing. You just got on track. So, um, there's a Purcell to your bill, please. We have it before us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the testimony, and uh, uh, I'm confident that we're bringing this, our bills for the same reason. And if I'd had elk in my district, I probably would have included that in my bill as well. But we haven't gotten this far south down into the committee area yet, but someday maybe. Um, but so, yeah, we've got to provide it. We do have a uh, about that, folks in, in my area, and uh, um, we've got wolves. I live next to the Chippewa Forest and semi wilderness, so they're, they're, they're around uh, fairly regularly. I, I, the only thing I want to say is I I, uh, I commend this from a, you know, I represent an Indian tribe, and Yang, the wolf, is, uh, has a special place for so I commend this, and I commend it as an old trapper I've trapped right many years. And uh, never trap well, never, never good, because uh, never protect. And I don't know if I would have, but, uh, but I prefer the trapping methodology to sport hunting. I think sometimes folks get a little bit uh, cowboy yahoo and, you know, yeah, let's go shoot wolves or whatever. And, you know, if you ain't going to wear it or eat it, why kill it? You know, unless it's just tongue under your shed or something. Right. Uh, so you can, it, 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 I, I come at it from that perspective. You know, I, I, I grew up on a farm. Yeah, we take care of what we got to take care of. Um, but we don't just go kill stuff just to kill it. And, and so that's, that's where I'm coming from. I want the agricultural folks in my district to have an opportunity to be reimbursed. The federal government is lax on this, absolutely. Um, but we got to do something. So. That's why I'm here. All right. Thank you, uh, Representative Purcell. Any questions for Representative Purcell members? Uh, uh, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just another question here on how we proceed. Your bill, as you mentioned, Representative, only pertains to wolves. And uh, we already have depredation programs. So would this be in addition to other funding, or would you hope it to be written in other bills that all pertain to the same topic? Uh, Representative Purcell. Thank you. Mr. Chair and Representative Anderson, I'm uh, wide open to how we get to the end product, but the, 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 the appropriation is open. We want to get some money in the appropriation, and my understanding is we're virtually out of money for this right now. So. All right, thank you, uh, Representative Anderson. Follow up? 
right, no other questions for Representative Purcell. Uh, Representative Purcell, uh, we're going to lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this forward, and thank you for being here today. I appreciate it. So let's lay it over for possible inclusion in the Agriculture Omnibus Finance Bill. Thank you, Representative Purcell. Representative Fabian, your bill. We could move them both at the same time, so if you'd like to move your bill. We're on the now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, would I move House File uh, 514 for possible inclusion? Thank you. Uh, we have the bill before us. Uh, would you like to go to I would, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, members, you know, first of all, let me say, the producers that I know and uh, who live up in Northwest Minnesota don't want to be first. Okay? They don't want their hands to be in the first place. Uh, they don't want their savings even. They don't want all the help running through their faces. But the reality is that is what's happening. So this is a way for us um, to compensate that for their office. Um, and so that's the first thing. We have shown the kinds of effects, and I agree with Representative Sundin that this has been a very, very sad situation. Uh, I hope that the President Colin Peterson and John Clyde and Tom Hammer, uh, they're working on some legislation uh, currently that hopefully helps us out. And to that point, um, I want to make it clear to Committee that once a value is established of the laws, um, because of the multiple avenues of bill that possibly going forward, no single producer can be compensated for more than what is the determined value of, of whatever the loss is. So they're not going to be able to get some from here and some from there. And now a calf that is estimated to be worth $1,600, they get compensated at $1,800. You know, we're making sure that we don't do that. So the other thing is that. Um, charging season started now. Um, Chair Hamilton and I were going to go up to uh, Kitson County this weekend, but because the charging season is out, it's just not going to work out. But um, it has really made it worse. Um, the number of uh, cabs that are going to be taken is, uh, is going to increase. So, um, the other thing that makes my bill a little bit different from Representative Purcell's bill is that, and I see that Department of Ag is here, I may ask that to come down and help me out a little bit. Uh, what I want to do is because these results are not basically empty, I need to make clarification. Mr. Cruz, um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the health claims that there are for forage loss or crop loss, uh, if they haven't been paid, they, they will be finished being paid here in just the next couple of days, and that will take care of uh, all the claims for fiscal years 14 and 15. Um, but the roof claims, because the account is empty, uh, is going to need some backfilling. And so what we want to do is try to come up with some sort of a dollar for the roof, putting up a spot here with you, Mr. Cruz, I apologize for that, but um, we're going to have to use the work, and that's why it's an appropriate, an appropriate appropriation, is to figure out where we want to leave on July 1, and be able to sit back and pay, pay on the claims. So, and thanks to uh, Representative Fabian, he has uh, had a dialogue with the department on this issue. We're working together on it. Um, the projected number that we have, and we don't have, uh, there's an exact science to it because we don't know how many tools uh, will uh, be born this spring, but as everybody has testified, we agree. There will be a significant increase in wolf population, not only due from last year's December 19th ruling to really keep us to wolf, but also because the weather conditions themselves are good. And the other example would be that cattle prices are going up. So if you lose a calf a year ago, um, that is in our account for um, compensation, the same way would if, uh, if the valuation of that cattle uh, goes up. You just can't be paid the market, you need to pay the market rate. So uh, the best estimate we have at this time is that at the end of this fiscal year, we could uh, have up to $150,000 that will not be covered uh, by the next buy-in. By that, I mean, uh, as, as the Governor Bert Duval uh, in early testimony in this session, uh, he proposed his budget to double the buy-in appropriation from $200,000 to $400,000. That uh, overall $400,000 pot of money is worth the next buying looking forward. It does not address uh, 
this hundred and fifty thousand dollars shortfall that we may end up having. Now, as uh, as I will reframe uh, throughout the session from my heavy day planning on that we don't budget those are facts that we've been asking that that's the best estimate we have. And we're just gonna uh, very briefly uh, that uh, what you all have heard today is is rather accurate in, in the sense that we've lost uh, since ninety eight uh, almost two thousand cattle. Uh, almost uh, 30 horses, uh, well, close to 6,000 poultry, uh, or about 500 sheep, and we have lost three lungs. And we do pay for lungs. Um, so anything that has a market value in the agricultural world can be recovered. So this was, we're talking about thousands and thousands of animals that have been put on this one. Uh, it, this fund has been poorly regarded uh, in the sense that the process is just being unfair. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Uh, I was a uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Mr. Cruz, uh, could uh, uh, answer as question as possible. At the very bottom of the bill, we, we speak to um, going back and going to current year uh, claims that obviously we can't pay right now because of, of uh, funding. Uh, uh, Mr. President was in my office uh, yesterday and we discussed the uh, how we might go about that. I guess my question is, um, will those unclaimed or unpaid claims, will they uh, be the first ones paid uh, once we get to the new fiscal year, or do you pay the last in first out? Because uh, obviously we've got uh, claims that go back a number of months, uh, and we're going to have a whole bunch more on the free that Start this month, next month, right? Right. So, anyway, but there's some question: Is this will this give you the authority uh, to first clean out that first batch of claims from this uh, biennium uh, right up front? Uh, Mr. Coons, or Mr. Feeney, Mr. Coons, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative Lewis, you're exactly right. We, as the department, as our which we we read the law, that's currently in place. We will not be allowed to persist for reasons. But the legislature has given us for uh, 1617 and, and back to this is the legislature, as I understand it, and Representative Fabian's bill that says we're making our time very clear. We want you to go back. And, and, and so that is exactly how it will be done because those are in the process. We don't value uh, it, that the requirement of uh, moving up that it is that global plus. So this would make that a temporary piece of us. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, folks? Uh, Chairs. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cruz, I often wonder about this. Why do we have two separate funds? Why not put the money into one fund, be able to pay either elk or wolf or whatever, or llama? Why not just get one one bigger pot? Mr. Cruz. Uh, Mr. Chair and Chair Anderson, uh, in some ways we have to do, uh, because these funds are able to move, uh, the legislature has given us the funds to move the funds wherever there's greatest need. So uh, the, the 400000 of next biennium can be uh, paid out through the wolf depredation account or through uh, the elk depredation account. And it can move, it can move out of either of those. So we don't have an account, uh, we have an account for purposes of this is trackable to what's been lost from wolves and this is what's been lost from trackable traceable to elk. But we do not have different accounts for um, so much for llama, so much it's just wolves and elk. And if there's more elk loss, uh, we move the wolf one over to cover it. And in the past, it's always good. We've never had an unpaid pay, uh, a claim in the past. This is an issue of first impression for Senate Group 1 elk. We've always been able to kind of move the funds around uh, through those accounts to make sure that everybody was compensated. Thank you. Chairs. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So then, why was one of those accounts, or let me see, the elk? And somehow fully paid while the wolf one was not all that I had, although we would have to each of them get a fear if you're able to move funds back and forth. Mr. Horst. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, it's over an operations problem in the sense of what comes to the door, it liquidates one rather than the other. So, you know, if we had the benefit of knowing what we're on the way in, we may have done that differently, but we kind of just, it, it, it's, it's what's in the queue. And so then we move the money to compensate those claims. I should add, though, there is one other little chapter to this. We did 